left Dead Man Lake Campground. We had a wonderful time there. It was a perfect place to spend our last day in Alaska. We are now on our way to the border. We're going to say goodbye to Alaska and go back into Canada. It had been nearly five months on the road in our truck camper when we exited mainland Alaska and crossed back into Canada to start our long trek back south to the contiguous United States. Mid-September was bringing cooler temperatures and wet weather, which was great for helping stop the wildfires that had been burning throughout Alaska and northern Canada all summer. And upon crossing back into Canada, we witnessed one of the last of these fires smoldering away. Our first stop back in Canada was along Kluwani Lake because it had some amazing shoreline boondocking and incredible views. We spent a few days here soaking in this majestic place, hiking the shoreline and watching our wildlife neighbors that would come and go. Once we got back on the road, our first stop was Haynes Junction. As the name implies, it's the junction of the Alaska Highway and Highway 3 that connects down to Haynes, Alaska. We stayed the night in a campground here to refresh our supplies and visit the Daku Cultural Visitor Center. Here we learned about the history and native tribes of the area and about Kluwani National Park that borders the highway to the west. This park is enormous, covering almost 9,000 square miles of rugged terrain and includes the second highest peak in North America, Mount Logan. This mountain is only 600 feet shorter than the famous Denali, but holds the record for the largest non-volcanic mountain by base area on Earth. After learning about Kluwani National Park and some more about Haines, we decided to make the truck south instead of continuing along the Alaska Highway. Kluwani National Park stretches west of the highway here, all the way to the Canadian-Alaska border that it shares with Wrangell St. Elias National Park that we had visited earlier on this trip in Alaska. It is part of a larger UNESCO World Heritage Site that encompasses four national and provincial parks and protects over 24 million acres of American and Canadian lands and the world's largest non-polar ice fields. We made our first stop at Kathleen Lake that is inside Kluwani National Park. We learned that this lake houses a very special type of fish called the Kokanee Salmon. This is a unique species of salmon found only here that does not migrate to the ocean and lives solely within the waters of this lake. These are sockeye salmon that were trapped in this lake when a massive ice dam formed in the 1700s by the Lowell Glacier, trapping the fish in the lake and forcing them to adapt to life in fresh water. When the dam finally broke over a hundred years later, the fish had genetically changed and adapted to now stay here year round. Further up the road, we hiked into Kluwani National Park up to a rock glacier. We followed this beautiful trail up to the nose of a glacier-like structure consisting solely of rocks. At one time, an ice glacier flowed down this mountain slope and got covered in falling rock debris. The ice continued to flow extremely slowly and carried the rocks downhill with it. Over the years, the ice melted away but left this amazing pile of rocks that is so distinct on this hillside.
Continuing our drive south, we found an amazing boondocking site right along a river before crossing back into Alaska once again. The final section of drive before getting into Alaska was high elevation tundra, but it quickly started to descend into a vastly different terrain of dense forest. And at these lower elevations, the fall colors all but disappeared. The road runs down into the Chilkat River Valley and follows the river out to the ocean and to the town of Haines. These river flats are also part of the Chilkat Bald Eagle Preserve that protects this river for the birds that use this area for both nesting and during their fall migration. We were here a bit too early to see the spectacle of thousands of eagles that stop here on their way south in November, but we did see a few of the local birds and learn tons about these spectacular birds from the educational signs along the road. After our time along the river, we entered Haines, Alaska. This small town straddles a peninsula between the Chilkat and Chilkoot inlets. While it is ocean water that laps at the shore, this town is part of the fjords and islands that make up most of southern Alaska's panhandle, and it is still 150 miles to the open ocean by water. We explored the peninsula here and visited two sites of the Chilkat State Park, which make up a good chunk of the land. We took a hike here along the Battery Point Trail to enjoy this lush northern rainforest and soak up the humidity that we had not seen all summer. These parks were popular with the locals and offered views of the town from the water. Back in Haines, I couldn't help myself when I saw a giant hammer on the main street. We are here in downtown Haines, Alaska, and they have a hammer museum. We have to check this place out. This museum has thousands of hammers on display and was started in 2002 by Dave Paul, a blacksmith and avid collector. The Hammer Museum had flexible hammers, curved hammers, gold hammers, soft hammers, big hammers, small hammers, and every other kind of hammer you could think of. Being a mechanical nerd and wannabe blacksmith, this museum was right up my alley. Haines is typically accessed by the highway we came in on, cruise ship or the Alaska Marine Highway, which we were opting for as our way out. As so many of the communities in southern Alaska are so far spread and roads are difficult or impossible to build, Alaska's transportation is frequently by air or water. Affectionately called the Blue Canoes, the marine highway ships sail between islands and mainland communities with passengers, cargo, and their vehicles. That's a big boat. We were loading the truck camper onto this ferry to make the short crossing from Haines to Skagway, Alaska, preventing us from backtracking and saving us upwards of five hours drive time. Our day for sailing had taken a turn for the worst with clouds rolling in, spitting rain, and very high winds but that is not too unusual for this time of year. All right, we got all parked. Puppies have to stay down here with the truck, but we get to go explore the ship. After getting parked, we went topside to watch our departure. These boats make some long treks up and down the Alaska coast and way out into the Aleutian Islands. For some of these multi-day sails, some passengers set up tents on the deck, sleep under the heat lamps, or make the indoor lounges home for the journey. 
While they may not be cruise ships, they are an economical way to get around the coast. And for our one hour sail, we thoroughly enjoyed it. As we neared Skagway, Alaska, the first thing we noticed were the cruise ships. We were told that this port can handle five ships at once and is a popular cruise destination. After a rough docking and high winds, we headed back to our vehicle to disembark. This town is a rich history, as it's where many of the miners sailed to during the Klondike Gold Rush to start their journey north. This town boomed during the Gold Rush years, and the Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park preserves its history. Unfortunately, the park was closed for the season, and the weather was too poor to hike the famous Chilkoot Trail. But we did a little shopping, as Gold Rush era advertisements still called to us from the hillsides, and the stores were still there. After our short visit to the town, we hit the road, driving the Klondike Highway that climbs up White Pass. Upon reaching the top of the pass, we settled in for the night at a pull-off, hoping the weather would improve by morning. As we had hoped, we woke to a much nicer day and continued our drive, making our seventh border crossing of the trip back into Canada. We had been down so many beautiful roads on this trip so far, but this one was definitely at the top of our list, winding along breathtaking remote lakes. About an hour and a half north of the border, we came to the small town of Carcross, the name being shortened from its original designation as Caribou Crossing. The town is famous for mountain biking and being home to the world's smallest desert. Okay, it's not really a desert, but it looks like one and stands out because of the tan-colored sand dunes that seem to be completely out of place here in the north. When massive glacial lakes of the past dried up, this sand was left behind and blown into this one square mile patch of sand dunes that we had a blast hiking and playing on. Our final leg of this drive took us to the city of Whitehorse, where we were mainly going to reprovision. However, we did explore the town a bit and visit Miles Canyon that the Yukon River flows through just upstream of town. We learned that the river was dammed near the town to submerge the treacherous rapids and make these waters more navigable. The rapids that are no longer were said to resemble the mane of a white horse and are how the town got its name. From here, once again, we would turn south as the weather was getting colder by the day. And while we thought we had seen the last of Alaska, one final adventure in the last frontier awaited. Mm -hmm. 